Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ellie May O'Hagan. I'm the director of CLASS, which is a partner um, in this event. We're a think tank uh, that looks at the lives of working class people. We've done work on the care sector before. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this event today, um, talking about Jerry Mitchell's paper about people working on the front line of the coronavirus crisis in the care sector. I am somebody who has experience of the care sector in this country, and I can say with complete certainty that it does not work and that we need to create a system, a care system that cares for people, how they would be cared for if they were, if, if we cared for them ourselves, and um, that also uh, supports and respects and pays decently the people working within it. So I'm really delighted to be here today because I think this is really important and it's something that will affect pretty much every single one of us eventually, whether that's because we have a relative who needs it or because we need it ourselves at some point. So it couldn't be more important. And of course, the pandemic has shown all of the problems in the care industry, all the, sorry, the care system, all the reasons why it hasn't, work, hasn't been working. Um, it's brought them all to the surface. And so this couldn't be more timely. So we're going to start with um, Jerry's going to present her paper to us, and then we're going to hear from um, Rachel Harrison uh, at the GMB Union. Um, we will hear from Andreen Williams. Am I saying that right, Andreen? Your first name. Great, thank you. From UVW, and then finally we'll hear from uh, Barbara Keeley, who's an MP who worked on the care sector um, until 2019 with the Labour Party. Um, but first, we'll start with Jerry with her really uh, in, important and informative paper. So over to you, Jerry. Before before uh, Gary starts, let me say just a few words uh, to about the project in general. It, it, took, it takes one minute. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Nicole Katsilis, and I am the co-director of the London office of Friedrich Ebert Foundation, which is a German political foundation. And um, yeah, let me just explain how this project is embedded in our foundation's work. Um, our office in Stockholm has initiated this project on the Corona frontline and um, all in general, it contains nine reports from different European countries. Under them are England, Scotland, Germany, many Northern countries and two Southern European countries, Spain and Portugal. And not all of these reports have been published yet. The report about England is one of the first. And uh, my colleague Juliane will send you the link in the chat where you can get to our website and then you can find the link to all of the country reports there. And um, I think the German uh, report is out as well. And we have an international summary. And Lisa Pelling is the author of this international summary. And it's also very interesting to read this, the summary of all the different international experiences. So our partner institutions in this project uh, come from Sweden. It's first Arena ID, which is a progressive Swedish think tank financed by the Swedish trade unions. And second um, partner is Kommunal, the biggest Swedish trade union, which represents the um, employees in the public sector and the care workers on a regional level. Yeah, and for today's event, I'm very happy that Ellie is chairing the event. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for coming and thank you for joining us. That's a very important discussion that we will have today. Thank you, Nicole. And I'm sorry, you're so right. I didn't mean I should have introduced you. No problem, you no problem. Sorry no about problem. that. Thank you. And um, over to Jerry. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. And I only want to talk for about 10 minutes because um, the value of this event for me is, is hearing from our speakers. We have some really great speakers. Um, you work in the sector and know so much about it. So this is going to take about 10 minutes. So if someone could keep a time on me, I, I hope I don't overrun. I, I've timed it for about, uh, I think it might be 11 minutes. Um, okay. As we all know, the virus hit the care sector hard. Just going to expand it. 
and this has led to many deaths and pushed care workers to their limits. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking through how the sector is funded, how it is organised and what it is like, what the, you know, the research has told me what it's like to be a member of its workforce. Without this context, it's impossible to understand why the sector was hit so hard and then to make it more resilient for future pandemics. I will then briefly look at how trade unions have supported the sector, as I know this will be covered in more detail by our speakers. The crisis has revealed that many of us don't know much about the care sector. More people work in it than in the NHS, 1.56 million. It has 8,000, 18,000, sorry, 500 employers across nearly 40,000 establishments. So it's very fragmented and very disparate. There is no one national budget. It is not free at the point of use, but means tested. Local authorities commission and purchase the care and most recipients will contribute to the costs. People with savings of over 23,000 um, 23, pounds will need to cover the full cost of their care and potentially sell their home to self-fund it. 41% of current care home residents are self-funders. Each local authority decides how much they will spend, although some funding comes with central government grants earmarked specifically for social care. Um, there, yeah, and also to say there are public, voluntary and community providers of care, but the majority are private. 84% um, of beds in care homes are currently privately owned. So who are our care workers? They're nearly all women. There are more home care or domiciliary care workers than residential ones. 21% of them identify as black, Asian or minority ethnic. And we also have a significant amount of migrant carers. One in five are born outside the UK. 27% of um, our workers are over 55 years old, years old. So there's gonna be a lot of retiring going on um, in the near future. In 2018, seven out of 10 care workers earned less than 10 pound per hour, less than the basic rate paid in most supermarkets. They are much more likely to be on zero hour contracts. Their pay can fall below the legal minimum wage when they are not paid, for example, for travel time between clients or for sleep in shifts. Progression, training and bargaining power are all poor or non-existent. A care worker with more than 20 years experience gets paid 15 pence more than a colleague with one year's experience. That was TUC research. Adult social care has to be viewed in the context of a decade of austerity with local government suffering the brunt of spending cuts. Despite falling life expectancy and an aging population, total spending on care is still lower than it was in 2010. And that basically means that only those with critical or substantial care costs will now get residential care and lots of people fall between the gaps. Care is a postcode lottery. The most deprived local authorities have seen far higher cuts during austerity, resulting in the most affluent having the most spent on their care. The sector is underfunded, understaffed and undervalued. Back in 2017, Exercise Cygnus, a government pandemic, pandemic simulation modelling exercise, warned that central government could not coordinate the care sector in the event of a pandemic, due in part to the fact that care homes are almost entirely privately run, as I've said, and at greater arm's length from government than NHS hospitals. On top of this lack of partnership, the sector has a self-perpetuating cycle of workforce shortage. In 2018-19, a third of directly employed staff left their jobs, with nearly one in every 10 roles vacant. And this has obviously been accentuated by the pandemic. Privatisation is also undermining the resilience of the sector. Efforts to increase productivity by means of privatisation have led to deterioration in the quality of care and the working conditions of employees. One fifth of the sector is taken up by just five providers, three of which are private equity funded. Over a billion pound is extracted out of the sector in profits per year. So with financial leakages within the system, increased funding is not going to address this issue. 
Market failure is rife with potential collapse of firms and constant changes of ownership. Before the crisis, 75% of councils reported providers closing down or handing back contracts due to dwindling fees and inability to respond to increased pressure. Private providers also don't want to run less profitable areas of the sector, and, and that includes domiciliary care. So in other words, the, fun, the funding dynamics have to be looked at. It's not just about more money. Of course, it's about more money, but it's not just about that. Governments around the world are being advised that they need to stop confusing price with value. The number of deaths of care home residents that we can see here on the slide has exposed the fragile state that the sector was in before the pandemic and the shortcomings of the response to COVID. And it is made worse by remembering that deaths where COVID-19 was not mentioned on the death certificate also rose. And it is likely that many of those were also from COVID but were not identified due to limited testing and the novelty of the virus making it difficult to identify it. And even then, we still don't get a real idea of the impact until we look at excess deaths. And that is the number of deaths above the expected number calculated by comparing the number of deaths from all causes with the average number of deaths over a five year period. And every report I've read with data in it on this has stressed that the data is very limited and incomplete, even on essential mortality figures of how many people died in care homes. And we can only guess at the impact of COVID-19 on people receiving home care services or those reliant on unpaid carers. By July last year, an excess of 4,500 deaths were reported among those receiving home care. As I said, that will be almost certainly be an underestimate. It's a guess, basically. When it comes to care workers, we know that they had twice the mortality rate of the general population. 469 social care workers' deaths were reported by January this year. And we know black and minority ethnic care workers are overrepresented in the data, as are migrant workers. And the last thing to say, which is really important, is that those affected worse by the virus have in general been those with worse health outcomes before the pandemic, including people in lower paid jobs, those from ethnic minority backgrounds, and those living in deprived areas. So what were the shortcomings of the response? Firstly, the care sector only entered the public discourse relatively late. So Public Health England on the 25th of, 25th of February last year said, it is very unlikely that anyone receiving care in the, home or the, in the home or the community will become infected. There's no need to do anything differently in any care setting at present. Imperial College research, researchers estimate that reducing contacts between the general population and care home residents by 50% could have reduced the care home deaths by 44%. Government funding was assured for the NHS at the start of the pandemic, but not for social care. Local authorities were given funding, but it was not ring-fenced for any one service. Patients were discharged from hospitals to care homes to free up beds. Some had been tested positive for COVID-19, others were awaiting test results. Both groups required strict isolation, which put additional pressure on care homes. Although evidence emerged that half of all deaths may have taken place in care homes, the government continued to downplay the importance of social care. As deaths declined in hospitals, they rose in care homes where the forgotten frontline of social care workers experienced a raft of failures to protect them. The difficulty of coordinating and the lack of any partnership between government and the sector that I've already mentioned became clear. The government at a ministerial level did not understand why they were being asked to take responsibility for the sector. Transfer of patients from, one hos from hospitals to care homes was one example of this lack of partnership. I've forgotten to, I think, oh, there we go. So during all of this, care workers were left unprotected with a lack of PPE and a lack of any guidance on infection control. Black workers faced greater risk of death than white colleagues. They were working long hours with staff shortages and facing huge responsibilities without protection. They were also under enormous pressure to attend work, even if it was against public health advice. They had limited access to sick pay 
and therefore, at times, were choosing between keeping a roof over their head or self-isolating. Countries such as Norway, with the lowest death rates, have the most generous sick leave benefits. In this crisis, the larger unions, such as Unison, GMB, RCN and Unite, as well as smaller grassroots unions, such as United Voices of the World, have supported care workers by negotiating for the initial job retention scheme and then its extensions and self-employment income support. They've campaigned for active service payment and statutory sick pay to be increased. They have flagged up that central government infection control funds were not getting through to care workers. They've exposed shortages of PPE for carers by repeatedly carrying out surveys among care workers. They've reported lack of testing, that testing did, that did exist was focused on care homes rather than domiciliary care and the real failure to repeat test staff in the sector. They've highlighted the lack of local laboratories due to cuts having decimated much of the country's local public health capacity. They've campaigned for safe returns to work after lockdowns, for example, asking for risk assess assessments to be carried out in non-unionised workplaces and specific considerations to be given to BME workers. And they've also played a vital role in shifting public opinion, raising issue, the issue of how essential care workers are, with the majority of the public now thinking that they are undervalued and should be paid better. Only one in five care workers are union members, compared to four out of five nurses. The unions are organising in a mainly privatised sector where workers are, as we've seen, spread out across disparate sites and there is a constant turnover of staff, so it's a real challenge. And those on lower pay are least likely to join a union. Some employers are also hostile to collective bargaining and raising concerns, joining a union or pushing for pay may leave care workers vulnerable to having their hours reduced, for example. All through the pandemic and long before it, trade unions have continued to campaign for longer term reform of the whole system. This includes a properly funded national care service, limited private sector involvement and proper sectoral collective bargaining to ensure a fairer system of pay, terms and conditions and working practices. Improving public support by explaining where their money is going and what it is paying for will be a crucial part of winning the argument for a greater share of national spending going on social care in the future. And I just left this one because uh, we all need to think, you know, I'm getting on in years as well. Who, who is going to look after you? I mean, it's important to stop and think. We're all, you know, it's an aging population. We'll need 525,000 more care jobs in the labor market by 2030. And care jobs like green jobs can become an area of future growth post pandemic but not without a radical reform of the care sector. Thank you very much. Stop sharing. Thank you, Jerry. I think that presentation shows exactly what I was saying about how important this sector is and also how important this event is. So thank you. That paper is really comprehensive. Um, I really hope that people in this event share that um the paper as much as possible um so we're going to move straight to barbara keely who's a labor mp and um until 2019 uh had a brief looking at the care sector so she really knows what she's talking about so i'll hand straight over to you barbara thanks and that, that, can i say that was an excellent report and thanks for inviting me to speak and it may be that some of the things i was going to cover we've already heard but i think it doesn't hurt to uh, to re-emphasize them um, I, th I think a starting point is really that so many of the decisions taken by this government over the last decade have weakened public services and left us open to being one of the hardest hit countries in the world during the pandemic. And as we've just heard, nowhere is this more evident than in social care. And uh, as you've just heard, I worked as the Shadow Minister for Social Care from 27 to, to 2020, actually, I uh, went through to then. Um, I, I, I believe that the government fundamentally don't understand the value of social care services or the value of the work that our hardworking care staff do. Um, and, you know, it's quite right to say, as we've just heard, that uh, care is underfunded and understaffed 
and staff are undervalued. Um, if we just take just one example, we have no workforce strategy for social care. There is a workforce strategy for the NHS, but not for social care. No plan, no reforms, no funding and no strategy. So even before COVID-19 hit, without that workforce strategy, we had 120,000 vacancies for care staff across the country. And as we heard, a turnover of 30%. Nearly a third of our care staff are only paid the national minimum wage and a shocking one in four of them are on zero hour contracts. So what we're talking about is a role where uh, employment insecurity flows all the way through different care jobs. Um, as this report has found, more than half of local authorities don't require providers to pay staff for the time they spend travelling between appointments, despite that being part of the framework for calculating the minimum wage. And um, people probably aware, the Supreme Court ruled recently that someone spending the night on a sleeping shift call in the home, on call in the home of someone receiving care is not eligible for the minimum wage for that time. Now that undervalues the work of sleeping care staff and it is really quite a worrying precedent to say that uh, that work done overnight is, is not to be paid at the minimum wage. Um, and I think what we've seen on that report uh, expresses really well is that it's over the last year it's, be, it's become really clear how damaging that insecurity and those issues with the workforce actually are. The most basic example, as we've heard, comes with staff who needed to self-isolate during the pandemic. I mean, the two things really, one is the guidance wasn't at all clear. And in fact, we, we, we have had ministers in, in meetings say that they didn't realise that care staff sometimes worked in one care home and sometimes in another. And in the early stages of the pandemic, there was no attempt or thought to stop people moving between care homes. But statutory sick pay was the big problem and it's been the big problem across the piece for many staff as well as care staff. It's woefully inadequate and only available to people earning over, over £120 a week. And staff on zero hours contracts may or may not get sick pay. Many workers on zero hours contracts are actually fearful that if they take time off work, they won't be given any work in future. I've had that said to me a lot of times by uh, care staff on zero hours contracts. You know, if, if, I, if I argue, if I'm difficult, if I don't go into work, then there won't be any work for me next week. So the staff have found themselves in, in without financial support to isolate. And so they did face that impossible decision, as we just heard, to stay home and face financial hardship or go to work and potentially spread COVID-19 to people receiving the care. Now, that's not a decision that anybody should have made. We should have put in, into place proper financial support at the start of the pandemic. Um, and insecure work of the kind we see in the social care sector is bad for workers and it's bad for people who rely on social care services. Clearly, it's part of the quality problem that we know we've got with social care, um, that we've got, for instance, such a high turnover. Any sector of 1.6 million jobs with 30% turnover has got a problem, hasn't it? Because, uh, and certainly if your um, family member has dementia, they may be seeing different care staff member after different care staff member week in and week out, which is not what you want with people with dementia. Um, so with the fa failure to support social care was not just limited to care staff. I mean, that, that uh, picture is really bad, but a decade of underfunding also means that care providers have been struggling to make ends meet. And even some of the largest care home chains uh, are financially fragile. And um, as, as at any one point in time, they tend to be one of the chains on the verge of collapse or, or being sold, as is the case at the moment. But then last March, at uh, the start of the pandemic, Care homes were suddenly expected to implement costly infection control measures, find and use uh, more personal protective equipment and have the resources to cover what was actually quite a high staff absence rate without any extra funding. I mean, there was an infection control uh, fund brought in in the end, but uh, it wasn't there at the start. And I, I regularly talked, particularly at the start of the pandemic, to care homes in my constituency. I know that the providers were doing their very best to protect people using their services, but it fell far short of what was needed. Um, for instance, not all the staff were allowed to use PPE. So the staff that were making food and taking it to people in their rooms were not, were not granted PPE. Um, so after all this, ministers had the temerity to claim they'd put an iron ring around care homes to protect them. I couldn't imagine when that was said, a statement that was further from the truth. There was no iron ring put around social care in this country, absolutely not. So of course, 30,000, some 30,000 care home residents died 
along with thousands of people who used domiciliary care. Some care homes lost half their residents during those outbreaks last year. I had uh, that happen in my constituency. And the grief and trauma to the staff who may have known those people for years uh, is, is, a, is a real factor for them. And, you know, most tragically, we've lost at least 470 social care workers who've died of COVID, um, twice that, uh, the mortality rate of the general population. And none of this was inevitable. I think the most important thing is to say this is not inevitable. If we'd had a robust care sector, which was well understood by government and the NHS, so that we didn't have ministers who said they didn't know that care staff moved between care homes and was given the support it needed from day one, it would have coped far better, really. Um, so the government talks, um, certainly in debates that I, I'm involved in, about how it much it values care staff. But we've got to go beyond clapping for carers and a care badge. Um, that, that was offered in the middle of this pandemic, a new care badge was offered as something that, uh, that care staff could wear. Um, there needs to be pay and respect as well as proper training and career development and seeing care as, as, a, as a, a vital uh, career and a career that people would choose. That's the position we need to get to. If we don't have those improvements to paying conditions, we're going to see far more vacancies because people will walk away to get better pay. You can get better pay in most local supermarkets than you can in working in a care home. This pandemic to me has got to be a turning point in how we treat care staff. Um, we've seen, I, I mean, there isn't perhaps time to talk about it tonight, but the work done by care staff is tends to be you know, wonderful anyway, but whether in a care home or providing domiciliary care, they were the front line. In my constituency, I know they were the front line and their work is every bit as important as work done by NHS staff, but their staff were often not given uh, uh, protected time in supermarkets, their staff were not given discounts that people were offering NHS staff. And care staff told us uh, in, a, in a recent meeting that they were totted out in the street if they were still wearing their uniform and they weren't working. So that's how care staff were treated. And they're going to get a pay freeze at best this year, like NHS staff. Uh, it looks likely that shrinking social care budgets mean that they're once again going to be asked to do more for less. So I return to the point really that we, haven't, we have a government that doesn't understand social care and doesn't care about shortchanging our key workers. We're now waiting for the government to come up with its proposals for reform of social care. They have failed deadlines on that 10 times in the last five years. We've had five years of, of hearing that, that we were going to have reform proposals and we haven't got them yet. Um, it, and it is very important to keep pressure on them on, on all these issues. So, you know, I think the report is very valuable and I hope it does get shared very widely. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. That was excellent, really informative. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and now we'll move on to uh, Rachel at GMB. Over to you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the report and happy to have shared that widely. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so I think just for me, I'm National Officer at GMB Union for Health and Social Care. Um, so I think, you know, covering a lot of what Barbara's already said, but, you know, in England, our social care is an essential part of our infrastructure uh, within our society. We've got an ageing population who need support and access to high quality, sustainable services in order to help them live with dignity. And I think if there's one thing that we can all agree on, it's that our social care system is broken and it's in crisis. It's crumbling after you know, a decade of, uh, well, longer of austerity and chronic underfunding of the, of the whole system. And it needs to be put to the top of any government's agenda. And I think it's an absolute disgrace that it hasn't been at the top of any agendas. Um, we've got a social care workforce who are overworked and undervalued. And this was an issue prior to the pandemic, you know, but now they've finally been recognised as the essential key workers that we always knew that they were. And yet they are still being overworked and undervalued. Um, even a year into the, you know, more than a year into the pandemic. Uh, the Conservative government have absolutely failed our social care system before and during the coronavirus pa pandemic, and sadly, they will probably continue to do so afterwards. The decisions they've made have had catastrophic impacts on the older and most vulnerable people in care homes across the country, and those impacts will be forever etched into the memories of our social care workforce. 
Our social care members have been let down at every stage throughout the pandemic. Um, just a few examples, so elder, elderly people sent into care homes without COVID tests in order to free up NHS beds. This resulted in COVID sweeping through the care homes and wiping out staff and residents along the way. We've got care, uh, our members reporting to us, you know, 20 residents dying in one week and yet they were unable to take time off and grieve for those people because it, it just wasn't possible. And then at the same time, watching themselves and their colleagues get home. Um, they were excluded from initial government guidance on PPE and the provision of PPE. Um, how can it be that care workers were considered not to need PPE or was it in fact that they were simply forgotten? Um, there were about 40 changes to PPE guidance in the first few months of the pandemic, so no one actually knew what they should be wearing or when or even how to access it. Um, and the latest amendments PPE guidance has happened just this weekend gone, where finally some stronger provisions have been put in place for certain situations. Um, but this is just one of the many continuing battles we're con constantly having to have trying to secure higher, higher levels of PPE for health and social care workers even now. Um, at the start, we had care providers contacting us, asking for our help as they didn't know what to do. There was no clear guidance from government for them. So everyone in social care was felt abandoned. Um, staff were denied access to regular testing for the first few months. And when it eventually arrived, there were issues accessing it. Some of the workforce were made to attend work on their rest days and reports of waiting for results for as long as a week. And then they were penalised with cuts to the take home pay following government isolation guidance. £95 isn't enough for any worker to be expected to survive on. And yet this is the reality for 97% of the social care workforce who are only entitled to statutory sick pay. GMB and others campaigned for additional infection control money to be provided for social care workers so that they could be paid full and be able to take time off work and isolate if required. And we won, you know, we got that infection prevention control fund. However, not all employers have chosen to use the money to cover sick pay. So there's still large parts of the social care workforce who are facing cuts to pay due to illness. And this isn't just an issue during the pandemic. Workers regularly face the unbearable dilemma of having to choose between going to work ill putting the life of those they care for at risk or putting food on the table. The pandemic has highlighted the disparity between the treatment of the NHS and the treatment of social care. And it's a system that's mainly privatised and fragmented and to such an extent that it was impossible for a coordinated and efficient response to a global pandemic. A system that's still waiting for gov government proposals for reform. They've been waiting for years. And yet the white paper for health and social care, which has just been published, has a complete lack of proposals for social care within it. And now social care workers are the one and only section of the population that the government are trying to force mandatory vaccinations upon. So what's, what's needed to change our future vision for social care? Well, for us, it's five things at GMB. So we want pay justice. No longer should the expectation be that if you work in care, then you do so on minimum rates of pay. We want a real living wage as a minimum and believe that all roles should be taken through job evaluation processes in line with local government pay structures. And pay justice means full sick pay is a contractual right for the social care workforce. We need professionalisation of the workforce. We need to celebrate, recognise and value that workforce with a system of registration in England in line with devolved countries. We need safe staffing levels to ensure that staff feel safe at work and so that service users and residents can access the level of care that they deserve. We need national sectoral bargaining to allow unions to negotiate national pay and terms across a system that is so fragmented that the social care workforce have been denied their right to a true collective voice. And finally, we need a national care service funded from the public purse fundamentally a system that is built to deliver quality of care and not to make profits. And so to finish up, for decades there have been discussions, deliberations and warm words about social care. More recently there's also been quite a lot of clapping. Uh, but the time is now to turn those words and claps into real change and we cannot allow for a return to the old normal. We must take action for social care now. Thank you, Rachel. That was great. And now to Andreen. Hi, everyone. My name is Andreen. I've been a senior care assistant um, for the past, coming up to 19 years this June. Um, 
in Gola's Green Stage Nursing Home. And we've been having trouble um, before the pandemic kicks in, but when the pandemic kicks in, it really opened our eyes to see that we as carers deserve better. During the pandemic, a lot of us as staff members got ill. A lot of us had vulnerable kids, vulnerable parents at home, but we didn't have the chance to isolate or not mixing with our family member. We have to keep, keep going. A lot of our residents died. Um, I think on my unit, we had 21 residents died. It was very emotional for us, um, very hard wrenching because when you develop a um, relationship with these service users to go back in the next day and you heard that these resident died it was very hard and some of some some of it was very personal for us as well with the bond we have then after we work all we got from our employee was just um, a slice of pizza to say thank you when we were risking our life and then we as a group said to ourselves, we deserve better. We didn't deserve a slice of pizza. So what we did, um, a colleague of us was with UVW and we all joined UVW. It was scary at first joining a union because as care worker, you always think, oh, we don't need a union. We don't need to join a union. And we joined the union. We started with UVW. Um, they said to us, we, our rights, what was right, what was wrong, yeah? Then after we gave our management a lift of command because at the moment we earn between 9.10 to 9.60 an hour. We don't get sick pay. Our annual leave, if you start today, and I'm that, that is there 18 years, 19 years, you get this same annual leave like us. We don't get weekend enhancement, um, nothing, nothing. Then we joined UVW, we went on two strike. We went on one from the 15th to the 17th of January. All we got was an insult email back from the board members. We kept persevering. We went on another strike on the 4th to the 7th of February. Nothing, all insults. Um, but we as a group of individuals, we won't give up because um, I think with this industry, I think with care workers, there's no lack of dignity for us, a lot of respect. And it's, 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 it's very hard in this industry, but the fight will, we will keep fighting as care workers um, until we are recognized. Because at the moment, I think in this country, what we realize that care workers is like, we're at the bottom of the pile is like, we're nobody. And the end of the day, we as care workers, our job is essential without us, who will look after the vulnerable adults in this country? We need to be recognized that we are part of society. I think for so long, society be pushing us aside, letting us feel like we are not part, we're, we're not included in anything. And the fight for us will continue because we are going to show the government in this country that it's time for them to recognize that we are essential workers. We are key workers. I remember um, when this pandemic started, for me personally, I have a premature little one. But when I come home in the evening, it was so hard for me because I, when they run to mommy to say, hi, mommy, I have to be pushing my kids aside to say, don't touch mommy, because it was a scary, scary moment for us. And you go through all that. And what do you get at the end of the month? Nothing. So you had to make the decision. Most of us had to make the decision. Do I work? Do I isolate with my family? but we had to choose work because we know that at the end of the month, the bills need paying. At the end of the month, there's nothing there, no benefit for us at the end of the month. So we had to make that choice. How can we protect our family and how can we protect our resident? So it was hard to balance, but we manage, we overcome. Now things are settled in our care home, but the pay is not settled. So the fight continues. Um, UVW is there today. We're dealing with recognition because I think it's time for carers to wake up, join a union, be recognized. Because if you don't stand up to your bosses, they won't understand. They won't recognize what it is like to be a carer. Thank you.
Oh, that was music to my ears. Thank you so much. That was a great note to, to end on. Thank you. And I'm sure everybody here wishes you solidarity in your fight.